uh, stood up, uh, stepped foot on, uh, on the mainland UK uh, yesterday for the first time uh, in over 100 days. So we now have things like bagels and black pudding and stuff like that, you know, sort of <laughs> previously oh. unparalleled uh, levels of, uh, of, of stuff. You know. That's something that I never really experienced. And I know I'm going to go off on a tangent here, but how are the Argyleshire bagel scene? How's that whole scene? It's very strong, actually, uh, really? in, 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 in our neck of the woods, yeah. Um, our young boy is, is a big fan of, of a, a bagel, smoked salmon and cream cheese. Um, that's, that's, yeah, we, we told him that we've got bagels. Go yeah, and he must have made, we went out for a walk before, and he must have mentioned bagels 30 times. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, well, fair enough, so. Yeah, so Fine. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, one yeah, thing yeah. I've always recognized that really had myself, and he made my time in Scotland very easy, is that uh, being a Jewish person, myself mm -hmm. and the Scots really can bond over smoked fish. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely, it's fantastic. Yeah. But back onto the main topic, which yeah. is <clears throat> World War One. And um, the uh, experiences of Scottish troops uh, serving uh, in Mesopotamia, and specifically the 2nd Battalion of the Black Watch, which is really interesting. It's the only battalion of the regiment which doesn't serve uh, the entirety of the war on the Western Front. Um, there, uh, it does it's start off... Yeah. yeah. Well, they're, they're <laughs> Scottish whores. Um, but they're... Um, so it, it, it's a really kind of interesting sort of uh, experience when you take a, an interesting battalion like the 2nd Battalion who are regulars who do serve some time on the Western Front. And Rowan, could you kind of grow a little bit of their story? You were pointing out some things before we started uh, about just how long these guys were outside of the UK. Yeah, it actually starts in 1899. They were at Aldershot went and went straight to South Africa. Um, and after the South African War, didn't go back to the UK, went to India because the 1st Battalion had been out in India before that and they rotated just at the end of the war, um, mainly because it was just a convenient time to do so. And uh, so the 2nd Battalion ended up doing the next 12 years up to 1914 in India, which is, is a really good thing at the beginning of the war, actually, because it, although they've been getting kind of slightly diluted with drafts from the 1st Battalion during the intervening 12 years, they effectively have some of the most experienced soldiers in the army and the empire um, at that point. So they uh, go to the Western Front in 1914. They obviously, because they're coming from India and there's a bit of a sort of delay in getting there, they miss the uh, ordeal that the 1st Battalion went through with the Great Retreat and everything, but they end up in the trenches and they fight to lose New Chapelle, all the battles early, 19, well, right through 1915. Um, and so by the time they actually go to Mesopotamia, they're actually, you know, they, they have a lot of experience. Uh, the battalion's been reinforced several times, uh, but they still have a lot of these uh, really good old soldiers. They have a lot of their original officers commanding. They're basically the best guys for the job, along with the, the rest of the Marut division, which they're part of, uh, all these uh, Indian units. Um, I think there's hand light infantry that's with them as well. They're, um, yeah, best people for the job out there. And, you know, so we kind of answered the question, um, you know, which Highland Regiment are we talking about? These are a core of regulars, which I think is really interesting, even after their experience on the Western Front. So sort of shift, sort of shifting from who these soldiers were, I was wondering, Dave, can you kind of explain to us when in this war we're talking about and and just give us sort of an introduction to to the battlefront itself and i'm going to make you the host in the meantime um yeah like to see well, any screens or have anything to share with us yeah absolutely uh, obviously the the main part of uh, the book it it's essentially falls into two halves it's the failed attempt um by uh, the the british and indian forces to relieve uh, the 6th Indian Division, which is trapped in Kut Alamara, uh, of, of which more later, uh, the battles um, leading up to, to, to that failed uh, relief, which was almost what you might call classic trench warfare. You know, the, as we've said before, there's this, like, there's this public perception that it's all very much just, you know, get out of your trenches on the Western Front and run towards the enemy. Um, that doesn't really happen in 
in on you know in, in the western front but it certainly happened here as the casualties uh, show so essentially this book deals with uh, the attempt uh, to get into Kut al Amara from the start of 1916 uh, fighting their way through uh, to the recapture of Kut and then to the seizure of Baghdad um, in the early months of 1917 which largely uh, closed down the campaign it still rumbled on uh, it, it sort of like flickered into life uh, towards the tail end of 1918 and it became very much sort of like a, a territorial land grab to try and uh, storm north and uh, this is actually what makes the campaign so fascinating uh, to me anyway because the causes of this campaign are strikingly modern you know for example the first world war on the western front you know britain going to war uh, for treaty obligations to sort of you know, they, you know to, to uphold the balance of power in europe that could be something that happened in the 18th century you know but the campaign in mesopotamia is run well from india and by india uh, originally to secure uh, petrochemical and oil reserves and that is something that unfortunately we are we're very used to in in modern wars especially in 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 this area of the world which is something we'll talk about later that history unfortunately repeated itself uh, so if i can just share the screen for a second uh let's have a wee look at this lad um da, 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 da. Uh, here we see uh sort of like the persian gulf and uh, the, 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 the main aim of the campaign was essentially to capture the oil refinery that was here at Mahamara. Uh, the reason why that this was so important for us in the First World War is actually a, a naval obligation. Obviously, uh, Jackie Fisher, the sort of like the, the architect of uh, the, the British pre-war and First World War Navy, had taken the, the bold decision uh, to move uh, towards oil uh, powered boats and uh, to, to, to rely less on, a, on coal fired there. So obviously this, um, this place here at Mahamadra and Ibadan on um, Ibadan Island, uh, this becomes sort of like the focus of the campaign. And uh, put simply, this is what they're after, the uh, oil refinery at uh, Mahamadra. So it starts off as actually uh, a fairly small scale campaign. The idea would be uh, that there would be uh, a landing uh, down here at Fao, uh, a landing on Ibadan Island, and a simple advance uh, up to capture Mahamara. But as we see, things start to go wrong straight away. Anybody um, you know, that's, that's read about this will see that there are lots of conflicting demands. There's the, the, the demand of uh, the military focus, uh, the military folks on the ground, there's the demands of the India office, there is uh, the overall British strategy, and that starts to pull things in different directions. Uh, so very, very soon, uh, we find that the British force has actually advanced, um, well, I say the British force, it's, it is, of course, an Indian force uh, with, with British elements. They actually sort of get you know, in, into what we would now call mission creep, which is something we're very familiar in this area as well, and actually advance uh, to capture Basra uh, further uh, up uh, the river Euphrates there. And that was never really part of the plan. So to put it in a nutshell, this was to secure strategic oil reserves and oil refining equipment for the Royal Navy, um, a very, very modern war, as a result of all these different competing demands, things start to unravel fairly quickly, as, as we will see. So, so yeah, that's, uh, that's put things in a nutshell for you. We're not really used to wars about oil in the First World War, but this is one. Yeah, this is one. And I think that's really fascinating in that you've got really this whole campaign designed by, by two factors. You've got the Admiralty, uh, designing, you know, we need these supplies to, to keep our new modern ships running. Also, as you mentioned, incredibly fascinating, this campaign is being orchestrated and designed out of India, not out of London, um, mm -hmm. uh, which, and, you know, we'll see the core of the troops that are taking part here, although we're focusing on the second Black Watch, are going to be Indian troops. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's really fascinating. So when we get into actual combat actions, Obviously, today is the anniversary of the first day of the Battle of the Somme, um, and we all really have a, 
uh, deep grasp on, on the fighting and how it evolved there. What are we talking about here when we're really talking about combat in Mesopotamia? What, what is that experience like? Brutal, and I'm sure uh, Rowan will, will back me up on that. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll show some, um, some slides later. Um, one of the things here is that we have this idea um, that Mesopotamia, modern day uh, Iraq, is sort of like a hot and dusty place. Well, in, in some areas it is, and, um, and in some areas it's not. Uh, the entirety of this campaign is going to be um, predicated on, on river transport up and down uh, the Tigris River. Uh, and at certain times of the year when, when the, uh, the river uh, rises, floods its bank, um, we will see uh, the Second Royal Highlanders wading waist deep in some places through marshland, sort of like Samfa marshes, uh, to try and attack uh, Turkish positions uh, across you know, battlefields which are billiard table flat. You know, and, and one of the, uh, the interesting things is in, um, with the Highland Regiment in Mesopotamia is that there's constant references made to the archaeology of the area. You know, it's like, this is the same battlefield that the Romans were fighting on. This was the same battlefield as, you know, like the ancient Greeks were fighting on and stuff like that. So, you know, th this, is, this is a well fought over uh, stretch of land and it is absolutely punishing, you know. We, we don't expect really in the First World War uh, for our wounded soldiers, if, they, you know, if they're wounded, uh, to drown. We don't, on dry land, dry land, we don't expect our wounded soldiers to freeze to death on a battlefield and yet, uh, you know, their bodies are going to be scorched and basically burned to a crisp in 50 degree heat the next morning. You know, we, we, you know, we don't expect that, you know, and obviously, there's a, there's a wonderful uh, Arabic uh, saying that basically said, uh, you know, God worked for seven days uh, and on the, the, on the seventh day he rested. Uh, he looked around everything, uh, was fairly pleased at what he was doing, you know, what he'd, what he'd uh, achieved, uh, and then took a little look at hell and therefore decided that hell wasn't actually hellish enough. So late on, on the seventh day, he actually created Mesopotamia as a place worse than hell to send the worst sinners to and it is into this place that he banished all the, uh, all the flies all the diseases and all the stinging insects uh, you know from the rest of the civilized globe yeah so absolutely hellish yeah. absolutely hellish yeah in, in terms of how it compares as well to the to the well the psalm for instance this kind of battles which are happening around the same time well, not really around the same time because mm -hmm. they don't really fight in the summer of 1916 because it is mm -hmm. too hot. It's too hot for the Turks yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, yeah. yeah um, I talk every every time we do this about the kind of the evolution of tactics between sort of 1902, 1905, and then 1905 to 1914, and how everything changes. Everything's really adapted. There's no such thing as 19th century tactics in the First World War, and there isn't. And at the Somme, these fire and manoeuvre tactics that they come up with really work places like that you know they do work if you're going to blame casualties on the first day of the summer or something don't blame it on the training doctrine <laughs> um, because you know there are places to take cover you can at least lie down in long grass and hide and fire but mm -hmm. when you look at these battles and i'm sure dave will show us some pictures later of these marshlands or these basically deserts and you can have 100 miles either side of you and not a rock to hide behind, yeah. nothing. You no. cannot use these fire maneuver tactics which they've invented, which worked even on spaces like the South African belt. It's even worse here, you just cannot do it. And so they literally just have to go into extended order and hope for the best. And hope even best. worse, at places like Hana, when you get caught between a river and a marsh, you can't even extend that far. You just get absolutely channeled. So yeah, if, if anything, we, we when we talk about kind of slaughter at the Somme and stuff although it's not quite on the it's not on the scale I think in terms of sort of casualty density compared mm -hmm. to the amount of ground covered yeah. most of the battle these early battles in 1916-17 in Mesopotamia are probably going to work out worse uh, percentage wise yeah 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 because that that's certainly one of the things uh, that the uh, that the book touches on that uh, the Seaforth Highlanders and uh, the Royal Highlanders have to be merged together as as just the Highland Battalion, don't yeah, they, the in, in terms of the casualties that they, um, that you know, that they sustain, quite incredible. Yeah.
Well, it, you know, it, and it's interesting. I think some of our viewers too will have some sort of idea or have heard of the Siege of Kut, mm -hmm. before, which is, uh, as we talked about, one of the main reasons for this battalion being deployed to Mesopotamia. Um, so a lot of the book is, is focused around fighting to relieve Kut. Um, so can you guys just give us a little bit of a background on just specifically this campaign, how Kut Al Amara ends up becoming such a pivotal spot in a spot that still kind of resonates today as we read about the First World War in the Middle East. Yeah, it, it, it's it's classic, classic mission creep, um, as you might call it. If I could just share the screen again, um, let's just go from here. Uh, as we've said, uh, to protect uh, sort of like the, the flanks uh, and, uh, you know, the, the hinterland, as it's often described, of Mahamara, they decided uh, to advance and uh, capture Basra. And then obviously, the next question here is, well, what's protecting Basra? So again, we see uh, a fairly extemporaneous advance up the River Tigris, uh, first uh, to, to, to Kerna, then Azaziah, uh, then to uh, Amara, Ali El Garbi, Sheikh Saad, and then finally uh, into uh, Put Al Amara itself. Um, so again, it, it, it's this classic mission creep, and it's 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 people um, pushing at an open door. Here's a, here's the battlefields that um, that Rome was talking about. As you can see, the nature of the early Ottoman defences were very very rudimentary. So uh, the Indian uh, divisions here were actually able to win a series of quite quite stunning early victories. Um, under the uh, under the command of uh, uh, General Charles Townshend, uh, uh, the com officer commanding of the, uh, the Sixth Indian Division, um, this uh, confidence is further bolstered on the 12th of April 1915 at uh, the Battle of Shaiba, uh, which is the first sort of like Ottoman counteroffensive, and there were a few touch and go moments in it, but. This was a photograph that was apparently taken in the middle of the battle, and you can see the Punjabi infantry here, uh, you know, barrels, uh, barrels of the rifles are pointing in the air, and they're having a wee chat. So again, there was this sort of feeling of, well, if this is for taking, and it doesn't really seem to be much by way of organised Ottoman resistance, then keep pushing on. Uh, if you've ever come across uh, Charles Townsend, uh, this is his book. Uh, my campaign in Mesopotamia. He'd actually been briefly uh, besieged uh, on the northwest frontier uh, up in Chitral in 1895. So he was sort of quite happy at sort of just painting in front of himself, laying literally laying the railway in front of himself as he uh, progressed. Quite an ambitious character. So he, you know, he wanted to press on. So we actually see the the advance towards Kut al Amara the eventual objective being Baghdad, uh, on a whole series of river steamers. And the entirety of the campaign uh, is predicated by these, these incredibly sort of like dilapidated and an antiquated paddle boats uh, being able to force their way uh, up the River Tigris. Um, he's doing well, obviously, uh, until he comes uh, to some very, very uh, well-prepared Turkish, uh, well, as, as it would have said, Turkish Ottoman lines of defenses here, a uh, place called Stesiphon, uh, near the, uh, the incredible tomb of uh, Salman Pak, and this, this, this enormous structure actually loomed over the battlefield. In order to force his way through these defenses, uh, he, he basically wins a, a Pyrrhic victory. Now, you might sort of say to yourself, well, you know, the, the Turkish trenches only sort of stand, you know, finish there at what was known as the vital point. Well, of course, the whole thing is these, these columns are, are, are trying to outflank the defences, but as we've been saying, they, they, are, they might as well be on the surface of the moon, and all their supplies are coming from the river. So any outflanking movement fails. So um, Townsend's basically forced to deliver a frontal attack, you know, pretty much shoulder to shoulder at bayonet point into the uh, to the Ottoman defenses. He captures the defenses and theoretically, technically wins the battle, uh, but has lost too many men. Uh, by this point, uh, there is uh, the threat of Ottoman reinforcements from Baghdad. So he then has to re retreat down the Tigris 
uh, and essentially wall himself in uh, to the town of Kut Alamara, uh, which uh, this uh, incredible aerial <laughs> photograph uh, shows here. So his idea was uh, to prevent further retreat, to pin down the Ottoman forces here, whilst the relief force came up not only to relieve him, but to finish off the job of breaking through the Ottoman defences at Stesiphon and then carrying on through uh, to Baghdad. So this is essentially uh, a, a real case of mission creep and overreach uh, that goes essentially terribly, uh, terribly wrong. So, you know, this is how these troops come to find themselves, the 6th Division find themselves trapped uh, in Mesopotamia uh, in the town of Kut al -Amara. And this is why uh, the 2nd Royal Highlanders uh, of the 7th uh, Indian Division are sent uh, to try and relieve them. In a nutshell, yeah, <laughs> whistle stop tour of 1915 in, uh, in Mesopotamia. Well, in, in the watch in this is very much like other British campaigns that predate the First World War. Uh, yeah. Looking at that map of the Battle of Satisfan, it immediately popped in my head that it looks very much like the War of 1812 Battle of New Orleans, mm -hmm. uh, where again the British were proceeding up the Mississippi River. Yeah. Um, but, um, and then hearing about this relief effort of men, again, needing to come up the river through desert environment, it's highly reminiscent of Gordon in the Sudan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, and so you can kind of see the British optimism as well as Townsend's optimism. Um, of course, Gordon's experience didn't go over well, but it began no. to become a British legend um, mm -hmm. by that point. Um, so as this, as this force is being besieged and cut, what are the experience and the engagements that the relief force, including the second Black Watch, are going through on their way north to relieve this, this force? Well, they're, they're pretty uh, legendary, really. Uh, if you want to, I, I don't know if you want to uh, jump in there, Owen, and, and, and maybe just just tell us about some of the, you know, the, the characters that are fighting this these battles, and then and then I'll, I'll I'll talk about the battles themselves because you know, as you were saying, you can really feel in 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 this in in this book like the palpable sense of losses when you think just like well, like Company Sergeant Major whoever has been with us since Marcus Fontaine and stuff like that. So you know is is, is there anybody that you'd, you'd sort of sort of bring out as one of you know the, the major players, the major characters in the battalion at this time? Because you know one of the guys that stands out to me is is Warcock, the uh, the CO, and how he he continues to lead the men. He's quite an old guy, isn't he? Actually, like you know. yeah, so, Warcock's one of my favourite. Yeah. You know, he's he's one of my favourite soldiers ever. of the period. Yeah. He, uh, well, firstly, I'm just, actually, first, let's look at some of the other guys. I mean, you have Lieutenant Colonel Campbell, who doesn't really do that much because he's not there for very long. You have his second in command, Major Stewart, who then ends up in the commanding the 1st Battalion at one point, I think. You have Warcock, who is a captain commanding number three company. You have uh, Major Sutherland, who's commanding number four company, who goes on to command the seventh Black Watch. These are all career soldiers who go on to hold very high commands. But Walkup's the special one. He, uh, the Walkup name is very well known in Blackwatch circles because yeah. his uncle, uh, Andrew Walkup, commanded the Highland Brigade at Marcus Fontaine and was killed leading it. Uh, Arthur Walkup, who we're looking at here, uh, was in that attack, was badly wounded in that attack, and actually there is one point in the, in there's an account from him in the Highland Regiment of Mesopotamia where he compares his experience of lying on that battlefield wounded to, actually it might be in the war history, I can't remember which book it's in, I'm getting mixed up now, but um, where he compares that to being wounded in this campaign and says just how similar they actually are. Um, but he ends up uh, command, commanding the brigade. Uh, he, he ends up being a full general at the end of his career. He um, does something in Palestine, I can't, can't quite remember. I'm really concerned with what he does in the First World War. But basically, if you read any account from the First Black Watch, doesn't matter if it's an officer or another rank, they will mention Colonel Wokop and they will be, they, they just revered him. It was amazing. <laughs> he actually, one of the, an interesting fact about him is he actually um, invented his own medal for gallantry, the Wokop Medallion, which could be uh, presented to members of the 2nd Battalion because they had such a problem with getting citations and stuff done 
being so far yeah. from the UK, basically. They weren't, they didn't have enough MCs, MMs, DCMs, so he just invented his own medal for them and they loved him for it, basically. Yeah, that's, um, that's certainly one of the things that Charles Townsend says in, in, in his memoirs there, that the India office is saying, um, well, you know, you can, you can hand out uh, a DSO, uh, four military crosses and two DCMs to that brigade. And they're just like, you could literally give yeah. all of the men that silverware. <laughs> like, yeah, 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 it's really interesting. Yeah. Well, it's fascinating to you. You kind of bring up a good point as we're talking about the men who are making up not only the Black Watch, but the other British regular units. Mm -hmm. A constant theme that they explore during the book that isn't shared by soldiers serving on the Western Front and uh, even some soldiers in Salonika or with the Egyptian expeditionary forces is this, this system of replacement and, and bringing in new troops. We've already mentioned that the Sea Force and the Black Watch for a bit are amalgamated into one generic Highland battalion, but are there other examples you guys can think of specifically about just if you lose someone on the Western Front, within the week, you could probably get him replaced. Yeah. But what is that like for, for a British battalion and specifically the Second Royal Highlanders out in Mesopotamia? Well, I think in the actual, um, when we get onto the sort of the final attack at Baghdad, I think they're being that everything's being commanded by a captain at that point because they just can't can't uh, can't replace people. Interestingly, we talked in I think it was the last one we did where we talked about sort of Scottishness and nationalism about percentages of um, Scots in the towns, and I just want to say that I've got the percentage for this one here, or at least woke up thinks that they if they discounted the bandsmen who came from or the band boys who came from the armed school of music they were over 95 percent scottish i think that did a lot for the esprit de corps especially for a, a unit which had been taking drafts in india you know you'd think they'd get diluted but they actually hadn't so yeah and it, I, you see some esprit de corps with this unit i mean obviously they talk about having a highland games during the campaign yeah. along the Tigris <laughs> stuff you see um that really sort of, and I've always kind of laughed or, or been really amused by photos, especially of guys on the Western Front having Highland Games. Um, it's simply because you know how few of those guys relatively are Scots. Um, but I think it is really interesting now, having read this book, um, talking about men who are so far away from home um, and who are very highly Scottish. Um, just that kind of connection, and, and even if they had never gone to a Highland Games while they were in Scotland. Yeah. Um, just. I, <laughs> Yeah, just speaking of the Highland thing and the Highland Games, there is actually, it was just before the war, but in this battalion, there was a Highland Games held and the Indian battalion here they were with for most of their time, the 41st Dogras, were um, sort of watching it and not looking very impressed. And one of the Black Watch sergeants asked one of their subadars why, you know, kind of, could they do any better? And he was like, I don't need to prove that I could do any better. We're Highlanders too. Because they are, they're from the hills in yeah. India, Pakistan yeah, yeah. now. And mm -hmm. yeah, just between these two units and within the unit it, itself, you know, it's this, it's really within this division, there is this spirit de corps as well. It's, it's not even just the battalion. It is, it is quite incredible that, you know, that there are constant, constant references to, you know, our fellow Highlanders, our brothers, you know, and, and, and relationships that are sort of like forged over many years in peace and you know which are like case and case hardened uh, in the uh, in the Pfizer war because in a lot of these attacks things break down pretty quickly in terms of losses of officers so you know they, they very quickly become sort of like what you, you know what are commonly called soldiers battles where it, it's basically just one side killing the other side if possible and this is where you find sort of um you know indian and scottish troops like mixed up but just going for it you know really yeah. really going for it that's where i was going to go with that as well is yeah, that yeah. there's at least a couple of instances of officers being detached in a black watch to take over indian army commands mm -hmm. because they've taken casualties um and so that again contributes to the fact that Italian, the men don't have a problem with being commanded by a captain or a lieutenant if he's proved, you know, if he's proved himself out there, really. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think this account, and we've gotten some uh, discussion about Indian troops on the Western Front, but um, this, you know, the accounts of the men who are out here uh, working side by side with the British are, are really interesting, and specifically this account, because they had spent so much time in India before the war, um, it, it's always fascinating to me 
to hear what the frontline British soldier is saying about the frontline Indian soldier or, or a frontline soldier from any of the non-white uh, colonies or dominions. Um, I think it's, it's really fascinating. So if you want to get sort of, for any viewers who want to get kind of an inside look, I'd highly recommend checking this book out specifically to see how at least the second Black Watch uh, treated and uh, associated with Indian troops, um, which I think is really fascinating. So we, we talked a bit about the battles, you know, them pushing up the Tigers, yeah. trying to relieve Kut. Uh, famously, spoiler alerts for those who haven't read this far into the Iraq campaign, uh, it's not successful. Kut surrenders to the Turks, famously. Um, but as a whole, does that make the entire Mesopotamian campaign a disaster? No, uh, and, and there might be some people going, there are 12,000 British and Indian troops surrendered there. You know, if, if, if I just share like uh, the, uh, uh, the screen here, you know, these are the, um, these are the battles um, that the, the, the relief force are coming through, uh, commanded by um, Fenton Elmer here. Uh, they fight uh, Sheikh Saad, they try and push through uh, the wadi. Uh, you know, th these are you know relatively sort of, you know, in, in terms of, did we capture the positions? Yes. So you know, like, did we do it uh, in um, you know in, in a way that was wasteful of lives? Yes. But again, you know, you, you can't, as as Rome was saying, you can't outflank you know the Al Hanar position there because this this is you know you, you're wading through water. So the whole thing here is, and, and this is actually the thing that I find most frustrating about this episode in the campaign. The Mesopotamian campaign was a resounding victory within the first few weeks. You know, it was sent to capture that oil refinery. It did. You know, so you know, in in, in terms of that alone, it was it was very very successful. So anything uh, that came after this was you might say sort of adding to that victory or in, you know in, in the case of this attempted uh, relief they're actually uh, detracting from it but um yeah we'll skip through this and just uh, pop back in a few seconds but as, as we're saying there yeah uh, here's general townsend uh uh surrendering on the 29th of april 1916 uh 12 000, uh 12 13, troops uh are are captured as the uh, as the Germans over in Free Corps on the Somme uh, were very very uh, keen to point out, but that is you know sort of like the the the, the idea of Kut Al Amara in in the eyes of a lot of people is sort of seen to be like the high tide of British incompetence and folly. Uh, we're only halfway through the story in many respects, because after uh, these sort of uh, these failed relief attempts. This chap is put in charge, uh, Stanley Maud, and he takes this task in hand. Felton uh, Elmer is, is quietly sacked. Uh, obviously, uh, Charles Townsend isn't going to be contributing a vast amount uh, more to the war in <laughs> sitting on a nice island uh, on, uh, off, off the coast of uh, Constantinople. In this house, it's been in it. Uh, but this chap here, Stanley Maud, is for me one of the greatest soldiers uh, of the First World War in, 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 in what he does in the Mesopotamian campaign because he is the first man that has the gumption to turn around and say uh, to, to, to India, This isn't working. We've tried it your way, it's not working. And it's at this point that, you know, this then becomes a British campaign run from London. And this whole idea of extemporized uh, caravans of camels carrying shells up, this whole idea of, ah, oh, stick it on a steamer, it might get there in six weeks. No, he immediately withdraws and starts a massive railway building scheme. And he applies not only what you might call military genius to this, but real sort of engineering genius. And this is one of sort of like the, the one of the greatest lasting effects of the campaign. Very much like Salonica, a lot of this infrastructure is still there to this day. So once he's uh, determined that he is uh, well supplied and that he is, you know, his, his logistics are sound, he then goes on to the offensive, and his offensives are some of the most brilliant executed by any British soldier in the Great War. 
uh, on the 23rd, um, as you can see on screen here, uh, he recaptures uh, Kut Alamara and, and brilliantly uh, launches what you might call the, the, the classic Fenton Aylmer headbutting attack at the Sanayat uh, position there. Obviously, the Turks know themselves that they can fall back to this thing called the Essene position. Uh, but what he actually does is he pins the Ottomans down here and then takes uh, what, what appears to be like a great gamble, swings out uh, 15, 20 miles uh, into uh, the desert, crosses uh, the Shat al High River, and then swings back again over the Shumran Bend and actually traps the Ottomans within their own defenses. So he's in, you know, in, in this wonderful pin and outflank maneuver, he's able to, uh, to recapture Kut Alamara and inflict you know, this, the same level of humiliation and surrender on the Ottoman forces. But you don't hear of this because it doesn't fit in with the lions led by donkeys sort of thing. We want the Fenton Aylmers throwing men at lines of trenches. We want the vain Charles Townsend. So in this sense, um, your man, uh, Stanley Maud, has, has been written out of history. Here we see uh, British uh, and Indian troops uh, marching in uh, to Kut Alamara. His, his capture of Baghdad uh, is absolutely remarkable uh, and wouldn't really in many places uh, have looked out of place uh, in, in, in the most recent conflicts there. What he does here is, is quite incredible. He actually flips his plan uh, to capture Kut Alamara on its head. By now, uh, the Turks, uh, you know, the Ottoman, uh, Syriac, and Arab forces are expecting these great big encircling pincers. And he does that again. But this time, it's the feint. And the real force of the attack, he literally just kicks in the front door and storms into the town. Uh, quite, quite incredible. And because he's got the logistics, because he's now not so much tied to the rivers, he's able to, uh, to, to, to take on these much more imaginative tactics. These tactics, of course, had occurred uh, to Elmer, they'd occurred uh, to Charles Townsend, but they hadn't got the logistics and they hadn't got the gumption to turn around to their political paymasters and say, are you running this or am I? Yeah. You know, <laughs> so uh, the 11th of March, 1917, uh, um, British and Indian troops capture Baghdad. And that, to all intents and purposes, uh, ends the campaign. Um, as we said, it's, it's, it's rekindled later on. But we're, we're dealing with a short, sharp shock, which essentially hurls the Ottoman Empire out of the war in this theatre of war. Quite incredible. Uh, and... It's, it's a real shame that Maud himself actually dies uh, of disease uh, towards the end of 1917, which sort of really, for me, uh, like completes the tragedy. So far from this being some kind of disastrous, um, you know, some kind of disastrous, shameful thing, the campaign of Stanley Maud in 1917 was British and Indian soldiering at its best for me, you know? Yeah, Organization guts grit drive, brilliant. Yeah, and you know, it, 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 it's really interesting um, as you talk about. I think part of the reason that this campaign, while being a massive success, isn't remembered is because of the death of Maud, um, yeah. who wasn't able to, you know, take Sir Ian Hamilton, who writes volumes about Gallipoli after the war, and yeah. you know, that's a defeat, but we still know Sir Ian Hamilton. Yeah. Uh, imagine if Maud had actually written his own experiences of the campaign. Yeah, um, it's very much like Edmund Allenby uh, in Palestine. We, 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 you know, he, he made sure that we knew about him. I mean, God, even John French got a crack at it. Like, you know, his is largely one of the greatest works of fiction since uh, War and Peace. Like, but, <laughs> but it's fine. <laughs> but uh, but yeah. I want, I want to, I do want to take it a bit back from the the generals up top down to the common soldiers again, and. Mm -hmm. um, I want to take three three theaters of war. Um, obviously, again, today is the, the anniversary of the start of the Battle of the Song. So mm -hmm. um, what is sort of that uh, experience? How did the major fighting experience differ? Um, why why it, do you think the Song, for as long as it went on, becomes much more remembered? 
Um, and also, how do you think that the difference in experience between those who fought in Egypt and Palestine differs from those who fought in Mesopotamia? Because while we lump, tend to lump together the Great War in the Middle East, really, as we've kind of explored through, through this chat here, you've got <clears throat> completely separate campaigns that aren't really talking to each other, even though mm -hmm. they're both in the Middle East. Um, yeah. So what, what, what do you guys have to say about that? Do you want to jump in there, Ern? And you know, obviously, because you're a, yeah, a major fan of the 1914-15 uh, Western Front stuff, and, and maybe a wee bit of the Somme stuff. Yeah, I mean, what well, I, I mentioned a wee bit earlier about the kind of fire maneuver tactics and how that works on the Western Front. Um, what for what's happening for the Second Battalion there? Um, they just by the time they get to Mesopotamia, they have had quite a lot of experience of this Western Front type of of warfare, which is very I don't know, there are a lot of similarities. There are a lot of differences. Obviously, by the time that the 2nd Battalion get to France, trench warfare is starting to be established. They go through the winter of 1914, 1915, which, to be honest, is a very particularly cold winter, but probably nothing compared to the winter that they'll go through from 1916 to 1917. Uh, if, if anything, you really need to consider the conditions that it just goes to each extreme. We know it was quite hot on the 1st of July 1916, mm -hmm. but that was nothing compared to what it was, what the second Black Watch were going through in Mesopotamia. Yeah. So even when we don't even consider tactical considerations or anything, the actual conditions, it's, pro it's definitely going to be worse in Mesopotamia um, than it is on the Western Front. And that's something that we should probably think about what we talked about in when we talked about the British Salonika course. We talked about how the veterans of Salonika sort of um, felt that they were sort of one club apart from the other people, you know, yeah, we were yeah, in Salonika yeah. and you weren't. And it's the same with the original BEF who were on the Great Retreat in their Battle of Mons. We were there, you weren't. For the ones in Mesopotamia, I don't think you really get that, but they probably should have. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're, um, but again, the Somme is always our, our kind of the, the thing that happened in 1916. And that's not a bad thing. It, it is, it's, it's extremely... Um, extremely important but it does kind of overshadow what was going on jim what was the question <laughs> no i i would think as well you know what was the difference of experience between those serving say in palestine um as those compared serving in mesopotamia um obviously we tend to group together the middle east yeah i suppose um, but you know what you know talking specifically about the soldier one one thing that that I think just to kind of get it started is you have a very interesting Scottish experience in Mesopotamia compared to the Scottish experience in Palestine. Um, as we talk about famous, very Scottish units like the second Black Watch, you've also got, I think it uh, reminded me which battalion of the Sea Force, or there's the first Sea Force or second Sea Force are out in Mesopotamia. As It'll well. be a regular one. Yeah. One of the regulars, you've got the first Highland Light Infantry um also out in mesopotamia so the some of the core highland regulars spend their big, big names very big names yeah, yeah out in um out in mesopotamia and then of course you have you have a, a territorial very heavy experience as well as a few new army battalions serving mm -hmm. serving in egypt and in palestine um so do you think that 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 those men who were serving in Egypt and Palestine would associate with the soldiers who were serving in Mesopotamia or vice versa? Or was that experience too different? I think that's it definitely was, a question for Dave. Yeah, I, I think one of the things um, that really is a difference between Palestine and Mesopotamia is, uh, the, you know, the, the local inhabitants there. Um, obviously, uh, in, in Palestine, uh, the, the local people out there were, were fairly ambivalent to the, the, the presence of uh, the Ottomans and fairly ambivalent to the presence of the British, the Australians as well. But one of the things in, in Mesopotamia is the local Arab population was actively hostile uh, to, uh, to the British and the Indians and essentially was actively hostile to any side, you know, that, that, that wasn't winning. Uh, and there are lots and lots of stories of um, not only having to deal with uh, attacks from Ottoman troops, but <laughs> sort of um, opportunistic attacks uh, from, you know, what, what, tribes that were, were, were loosely called, you know, in the parlance of the day, the Marsh Arabs that would be in there uh, to sort of like, you know, rob the bodies, 
uh, and finish off, uh, finish off the wounded of, of both sides. Uh, one of the things that's really striking is I think for the Palestine campaign, uh, yeah, it was obviously dreadfully, dreadfully hard fighting, but it, it was well organized, you know, a lot of the time, you know, it was well organized. Uh, there was, you know, there was uh, um, sea uh, routes down the Mediterranean. There was uh, quite a lot by way of uh, rail links and, and things like that. There was generally more habitation in Palestine. There wasn't really in, in, in this area, <coughs> excuse me, of the world. If I, if I just, um, so let's just share the screen again. Uh, one of the things that's really uh, striking is just in, in terms of the, the material resources that were motivated uh, for the Palestine campaigns. What we're actually looking at here is, believe it or not, a preliminary bombardment <laughs> on uh, the uh, the El Hanar positions, and as Rome was saying before, it was just like it's, it's literally like three puffs of smoke in the background, <laughs> you know. So we you know we can see a shell bursting in uh, in, uh, in 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 the distance here, uh, more shells sort of exploding there. But there was this you know complete poverty of resources that Mesopotamia, you know, the, the campaign was expected. To keep on producing and, and, and continue to aspire to you know, continually ever bigger things, but with diminishing numbers. Um, there were drafts for the British battalions, but there really wasn't much by way of reinforcement for the, you know, the Indian battalions. And this is something that Townsend comes back to time and time again in his memoirs. He was saying, how many men do you think are in this battalion? You know, when he, he puts, you know, there, there are tables in, the, in, in, in his book here where he's got 100 men in the battalion, 80 men in the battalion that are maybe defending half a mile of, uh, of the perimeter wall at uh, Kut al Amara, you know. And you just wouldn't see scenes like this on the Western Front. This is the Seaforth Highlanders getting ready to attack. So there are no sort of like big over the top moments uh, in you know, in, in, in Mesopotamia, you, you literally just stand up and, and walk towards the enemy. And it, it almost reminds me of sort of like, I, I worked with a couple of nights back, the opening scenes of Gangs of New York, where like the two sides just square off on a big level yard, and just start gouging at each other, like, you know, absolutely incredible. And, you know, if you're wounded, as we can see here, the sea force, you know, you just lie there. There's, there's, nothing, to be, there's nothing to be done for you. You know, so it's brutal, but I sometimes think perhaps all of this is played down because the battalions were regulars and they're just like, well, yeah, we're, we're ridiculously hard. We're ridiculously hard. To, so, yeah, it was like this in South Africa, mate. It well, was like this in Ticonderoga, mate. Yeah. Like, do you know what yeah. I mean? Whereas perhaps if, you know, the 52nd Lowland Division were maybe apt to go, bloody hell, this is mad. I shouldn't be here. I should be at my shipping insurance desk. This is bloody dangerous. I'm gonna tell somebody about this. Yeah. Well, there does seem to be that with like the, the regular battalions are just like, well, what are you paid for? You pay to get shot at and you pay to kill people. Crack on, fella. You know, there is that sort of like machismo that does come through in with a Highland Regiment in Mesopotamia. And you sort of think to yourselves, well, Fair enough, lads. Like, like you know, it, it's almost a case of yeah, it was, it was ridiculously hard, but you know, we we can manage it. You know, I wonder whether there's something in that regular to to, to territorial to new army experience. I don't know. You know, I would just say yeah. since you've uh, mentioned the the fact that it was like this in South Africa, and you mentioned the wounded yeah. just lying there, it's an interesting um, episode that happened at the, after the third attack yeah. at Sinaiat. Um, mm -hmm. The war history, second Black Lives War history records that the Turks uh, showed a hospital flag and called for an armistice to deal with the wounded. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is that Walkup says that the Boers did exactly the same thing after Marcus Fontaine, and it was mm -hmm. the same, you know, and he could remember lying there wounded, having basically the same experience. Um, and and basically that had although on the Western Front you do have these kind of informal local truces and obviously famously on Christmas Day 1914 that happened, although it didn't happen for the Black Watch and they lost a lot of guys on Christmas Day. But um 
the, the point is that they they did this because they, both sides just kind of went right, we got to stop lads and do something about this there are too many wounded just lying here in and there is no there's nowhere for them to go there's there's literally just nothing we have to clear the battlefield up um, and it's honestly in some cases as simple as that that you know there there's no there's just nothing there they're just fighting yeah, yeah. a battle on basically a flat desert one of the uh, one of the things um that my wife, uh, Mrs. Clark, is just actually just, uh, just, uh, yeah. oh, right, okay, there's a rainbow. It wasn't any bloody rainbows in Mesopotamia, yeah. yeah. All right. It was a mirage, we need to talk about the mirage. <laughs> yeah, we'll need to talk about that, yeah. Um, you know, sort of like one of the things uh, that a, a, a boatload of wounded troops came into Basra and uh, it came alongside and one of sort of like the, the, the guys on the banks of, um, of the river shouted to the to the RAMC staff throw the ropes throw the ropes to us and we'll we'll you know we'll pull the boat in because the current is quite strong uh, and the, the the chaps the RAMC staff on the boat were saying what ropes and they're like the ropes hanging down the side of the boat and they were like that's not ropes and they were literally gouts of dried dysentery and feces that had basically oh. sloshed off the deck and were had basically solidified down the sides of this hospital ship. You know, you don't get that elsewhere. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, and you guys specifically mentioned, you know, dealing, cleaning up the battlefields, dealing with the wounded and dead. And, and unlike some of the other battlefields we talk about, even Salonika, some of the battlefields in Egypt um, and in what is now Israel or Palestine, um, this isn't, these aren't places you can visit necessarily right now, unless you're in a particular <laughs> line of work. Um, yeah. but you know, what is, what, what is there? What, what, what remains, as I ask in most of our discussions, what remains of sort of this campaign, uh, in Mesopotamia during the war? Well, there are, of course, Commonwealth war graves. Um, but as Dave said, infrastructure like railway lines and things stayed. Uh, I should just say, that's why I jumped in now is that when I talked about sort of cleaning out the battlefields, I mean, it's not kind of like I said about, you know, both sides kind of both wanting to actually, you know, deal with it because they couldn't fight anymore. More that um, it's, it's just too difficult. Like if you go out, it's, you can't just go out at night over these massive battlefields and get the wounded in like you could on the Western front. It's really is the problem. And I've not looked into this very much, but I would expect that there are still, huge numbers of missing and unrecovered bodies in these yeah. on on these massive uh, fields mm -hmm. yeah 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 certainly one of the um one of the things um that's happened uh, relatively recently is obviously um it's nigh on impossible uh, to to reach uh, some of these memorials and uh, some of these cemeteries and uh, unfortunately quite a few of them um have been sort of like damaged and uh, desecrated and, and, and essentially just neglected over the years. But one of sort of like the paradoxical things which has come around with, um, you know, the, the 1990, 91 uh, conflict in Iraq and, and, and then the later conflict and subsequent occupation is that uh, Commonwealth War Graves gardeners and commissioners have been able to actually get to these places and uh, restore some of the damage. Uh, I think these are uh, uh, American troops that are clearing a British cemetery. And I, I found this uh, uh, picture quite incredible here that we, you know, we've got um, papers and officers of the Royal Highlanders, you know, the, the, the Black Watcher of, of today, uh, repairing and uh, reconsecrating, rededicating. Uh, these cemeteries as uh, you know sort of like what you might call like a, an intergenerational inter-soldier sort of act you know which is which is which is quite incredible that you know that these regiments are still fighting in these areas you know the guts of the century on and they are now going out of their way to sort of honor the graves and honor the battlefields of their antecedents despite the fact that they are still active battlefields in some cases you know? of course that was one of the big points in the debate about amalgamation before uh, mm. the creation of the royal regiment of scotland in 2006 was the fact that the black watch was basically on the same battlefields that they fought over mm. 90 odd years before and um, of course they now basically are not the black watch anymore but um you know you'd think it would have counted for something yeah <laughs> so, well. 
in the, in at least the red hack will still there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That still counts. Um, yeah. But, you know, with uh, kind of with that, for those uh, viewers either watching live or watching later who are interested in the Mesopotamian campaign, um, what other works would you guys recommend picking up or reading? Uh, there's there's uh, several uh, a really good um, one is uh, Battles on the Tigris, which I don't have a, a copy with me at the moment. But this sort of you sometimes get a wee bit mixed up in just like is this now the third or fourth time that they've attacked this same place and who's this guy and and you know the, the, there's a lot of characters in this and a lot of replacement of senior officers. Uh, so Battles on the Tigris is. Um, a, 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 you know, like a real good go-to sort of like first base to I'd really uh, encourage you to, uh, to, to chase down, uh, if you can, uh, my, ca my campaign in Mesopotamia uh, by Charles Townsend, obviously the, uh, the commander who was, um, was, was trapped in Kut Alamara. He's uh, come across in, I think it's uh, some of John Laffin's books, like British butchers and bunglers, of uh, of the Great War and stuff like that, he he features sort of front and centre uh, in a lot of those. Uh, but it's it's actually very very interesting to read what this highly scientific soldier was trying to do. And interestingly enough, Charles Townsend was an expert military historian as well. So when he explains uh, his battle plans, when he explains sort of like his ideas for defence, he he will actually compare them to. This is what Napoleon did here. This is why this happened at Austerlitz. This is why this guy failed at Antietam and stuff like that in the American Civil War. So he was a really, really, you know, he basically said, more or less, I should have stuck to being a bloody military historian instead of trying it out for myself, shouldn't I? It's really hard. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's, it's actually fascinating to see what he was trying to do with very, very limited uh, funds, with very, very limited uh, amounts of men uh, and machinery, uh, et cetera, et cetera, virtually no infrastructure. He's sometimes quite a difficult character to like. He comes across as very sort of like nitpicky and paragraph 23 says, but you really do feel for him at the end of it where, you know, he, he, he's literally saying, I cannot feed these men in, in, in Kut Alamara anymore. And a lot of the Indian troops have actually been slowly starving to death because they won't eat horse meat. And you know, and you actually you get a, it's, a, it's a much more personal sort of view of the campaign. So if you can chase that one down, I, I'd recommend that as well. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. I there just say, I think yeah. I say, uh, I just I think I say this every time. The Black Watch War History is written by General Walkup. Uh, all three volumes of it are edited edited by him but the second battalion history in the first volume is written by him and it's it's every detail of the unit that we've been talking about he even writes notes on what they were wearing yeah you know why they threw their bulletproof jackets away that they got issued you know all sorts of these weird little things uh he goes into detail about the walk up uh, medallion that he invented things like that it's just worth getting one if you can get one but most of the time you can't because they're ridiculously rare these days unfortunately but there are reprints and i think jim's had mm -hmm. some success with those yeah, yeah definitely recommend the reprints and we'll link all these books um in the group after rowan will because he's very mm -hmm. responsible yeah okay. it's good like that it's good like that yeah won't well, hamish will because i'm calling him hamish him. Will. <laughs> good but, God. <laughs> well, with that guys um Thank you for the great discussion. I know we'll be back uh, in a few weeks to talk about yet another book. We'll do a better job of promoting that one in advance and get uh, get dates locked down a bit in advance. But uh, any final words before we sign off? Just get into Mesopotamia. It's it's mm -hmm. an epic. It is an epic. It's got, as you were saying before, Jim, that incredible sweep of almost Gordon at cartoon sort of sort of style. Absolutely incredible, yeah, multifaceted, multi sort of racial, multi religion, far more to it than meets the eye, and very, very modern with that whole petrochemical link, which unfortunately carries on uh, to this day. And, and, and this is the campaign that actually gets uh, a jihad launched on uh, on the British Empire, something that resonates uh, to this day as well, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I would definitely say that, you know, we talk about the First World War as being old meets modern quite often. And in that case, we're talking about the Western Front. But 
the Mesopotamian theater is that as well, just in a very different context. Um, mm -hmm. So I would highly recommend everybody explore uh, this campaign a bit more. Rowan, anything to throw away? Um, just something I'm really annoyed I didn't mention earlier, or I did, but then forgot about it, was just that when we talked about the, um, the differences in actual you know, fighting on the front. Um, we mentioned rainbows and the mirage. It's actually mentioned mm. in both in both the war history and the Highland Regiment of Mesopotamia that they could actually use the mirage on the horizon basically to advance without the enemy being able to see them. It's just these mental things that you wouldn't really think of that, but they can actually use to their advantage in Mesopotamia. It is so different from the Western Front. Um, yeah. So it's just, it's just so worth studying. Mm -hmm. I'll just uh, I'll just bring that up briefly. Sorry for flicking through here, folks, but uh, yeah, there we go. This is the sort of thing that uh, you can actually advance through. Yeah, and that you... will hide an extended line of troops yeah. if you yeah. do it at the right time of day, basically, the right distance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely incredible. Crazy. There we go. Well, with Thanks very much for that one, Jim. Yeah, no problem. If I could just get host back, and then uh, if for those of you who want to rewatch or watching later, it'll be up on YouTube. Um, and with that, uh, we will sign off and we will talk to everyone later. Thank you very much, Shums.